life can change so quickly. It changes so quickly. It seems like just last week I was 18 years old and I was graduating from Eisenhower High School and I was borrowing money from my dad. Now I'm dad and my greedy kids want my money. But nowhere does life change quicker than in relationships. Sometimes even, especially in a marriage. Listen to this little joke. The wife woke up one morning and said, Honey, I just had a dream that you bought me a new gold necklace. That, what do you think that means? I don't know, said the husband, but Valentine's Day is coming soon. Tuesday, you'll know. He replied, and a few nights later, she woke up again and said that she had another dream. This time I dreamed you gave me a pearl necklace. What do you think it means? I don't know, said the husband, but Valentine's Day is coming, and it'll be Tuesday. Tuesday, Valentine's Day, you'll know what the meaning of the dream is. Well, the night before Valentine's Day, she woke up again to tell her about her dream. And this time she said this, this time I dreamed that you bought me a diamond necklace. What do you think it means? And the husband said, honey, be patient. You'll know tonight on Valentine's night. Well, that evening, the husband came home with a package and he gave it to his wife. And delighted, she began to open it and open it. She opened up the box only to find this, a book entitled The Meaning of Dreams. gentlemen. But life turns so quickly. Personally and spiritually, life can change on a dime. And let me warn you that the moment you mature as a believer, that you feel that you've arrived, is a moment of danger. The moment you think you've got this whole Christianity thing figured out, the day you think you have a great spiritual victory, look out. Because if you're taking notes, our one simple truth is this. My life focus cannot be on my failure. My life focus cannot be on my failure. L look, I, I didn't take a poll, but I think I know the answer to this question. I had some type of failure. Some of us are better at it than others. And some of us struggle with failing at things that we've done, and we can't get past it. But inside this room, we are all failures. Let me use a Jesus biblical word, sinner. We are all sinners. But my focus cannot be on my failure. One of the greatest ways you get unfocused is that Satan will get you to focus yourself on the mistakes you've made in your life. And that David is about to realize that. Last week we said this, that to stay focused, number one, I have to remember my weakness. Number two, I have to kill my pride. And number three, I have to be ready for old enemies. David will confront these attacks and he will survive. But Satan doesn't give up. There he is. Just because you win on one week does not mean Satan's going to be gone the next week. Just because today you get victory over your weakness and you're given the strength and you see God work a miracle in your life does not mean the battle is over. The battle will be completed when you close your eyes for the last time your last breath and you open them to see Jesus. The battle will be completed not when you walk down Main Street, but when you walk down streets of gold. The battle will not be when you are reunited with believers in church, but when you are reunited with believers in heaven who have gone on before you. That is when the battle will be complete. And until then, you are a stranger in a strange land walking through this pilgrim and Satan wants to get you to focus on your failures. Focus on your mistakes. David is the anointed next king. He's killed Goliath, and in verse 16 it said, But all Israel and Judah love David. King Saul is out to get him. He's already tried to throw a javelin at him twice and kill him. He's trying to confuse David, just like the enemy will do to you. So today in verse 20, watch how Satan advances. Again, he's going to bring back one of David's old weakness. David's weakness women. We know that by the story of Bathsheba. Let me just remind you, look, look at me. Repeatedly, David got victory over his old weakness of women, but he did not and was not ready on Bathsheba Day. It was not a new thing that happened for him at Bathsheba. It is repeated. We're going to see a couple times David's weakness come up, and he'll get victory from time to time, but it was just one time. All you need is one day of your guard down and the enemy will attack you. That's why every day we get up and we sacrifice and kill the old man and 
spend time with the Lord in our Bible, spend time in prayer, and ask God to give us strength to get through this day. Verse 20, a little, little commercial for doing your devotions. Okay? Verse 20, and Micah, Saul's daughter, loved David. Next week we're going to talk about Michael. And they told Saul, and the thing pleased him. And Saul said this, look what he said. Pastor Ralph kind of laughed at this a little bit about a reference towards a wife and a woman. But I will give him her that he may be a snare to him. Young men, men, I bet you she was pretty. I bet you she was good looking. I bet you she smelled good. I bet you she had curves in the right place. And I bet you as she would walk by, you would stop and everybody would look at her. But she Saul said to David, Thou shalt this day be my son-in-law in the one in, in the one of the twain. Uh, put, if you like to put notes in your Bible, put 1 Samuel 19.11. 1 Samuel 19.11 tells us that they are married, and David will survive the attack before, but he's going to give in here. Next, watch how Saul or Satan will play on David's pride. Watch this in verse 22. And Saul commanded his servants, saying, Commune with David secretly say, Behold, the king hath delight in thee, and all his servants love thee. Look at this. This is the guy who just tried to kill him. What is he doing here? He's lying. You've all had salesmen say nice, smiley things to you. You've all walked out of used car lot, and the guy is your best friend. And as soon as you say no, suddenly you're not as cute anymore. As soon as you say no, you're not as smart as you used to be. As soon as you say no, they don't want anything to do with you. Why? Because they're playing on your pride. This is what Saul or Satan is trying to do to David. Play on his pride. Look back at verse 22. Behold, the king hath the light in thee. Lie. And all his servants love thee. Lie. I'm just adding that if you're not following along in your Bible. Now, therefore, be the king's son-in-law. Do you notice something here? He never says, listen, look at that. He never says, marry my daughter. What he says is, be the king's son-in-law. He doesn't say marrying her will be a great thing, but the attraction of marrying her isn't that she's a wonderful person. The attraction is you'll get to be the king's son-in-law. Saul is playing on David's pride here. Now, part of David wanted to be more than just a shepherd boy. He did. It's human nature. He had to. You're never quite satisfied with where you're at. You're always thinking, you know, maybe we could paint this room. You're always, you know, I need a new couch, or, you know, it'd be nice as a new toy or a boat or, or something to do to get me out of church. Just extra cathedral work. But anyway, um, you're just like that. And so is David. He's probably thinking, yeah, maybe... God's going to do it. And David is sort of helping God's plan out. You know what? You can do that a lot. I've had young couples, well, we're going to live together, and this is God's plan. That's not God's plan. He said, well, well, Pastor Steve, I have a way that I can make a lot of money, but it involves me being just a little bit dishonest. That's not God's plan. But I'll tithe on it. We'll take it. I'll tithe and I'll give on it. All right, fine. But that's not God's plan. I had one lady tell me once, uh, I'm playing the lottery. 
kind of knew how I felt about that. And I think the lottery is just a tax on poor people. But and she says, I'm playing the lottery. And I said, okay. And she goes, I know you're against that. She said, but uh, if I win, I promise you I'm, I'm going to tie. And you're going to get a million dollars. And uh, I just laughed and thought, sure, I will. You know, whatever. That's, that's it. And someone asked me that was standing one of my bets, well, would you really take that? And I said, yeah, the devil's had it long enough. We'll take it. And uh, <laughs> we'll do something for Jesus with it. David's pride is being pushed here. Maybe I want to be more than a shepherd boy. Watch verse 23. Look at the subtlety. And Saul's servants spake these words in the ears of David. And David said, Seemeth it to a light thing to be the king's son of law? Does he even mention her name? He doesn't. David is sort of starting to fall into the trap. He doesn't mention. One of the biggest traps you fall into is when you don't treat people the way they deserve. This young lady, whoever she is, whatever character she had, whatever, deserved to be more than treated like an object. David is calling her just a stepping stone into the palace. All she is, listen, when you see people as an annoyance, instead of the creatures, the beings, the people with souls who live for all, for eternity, that God sent his only son to die on on a cross for their sins and yours, when you see them as an annoyance, That's the first beginning of a major trap in your life. Amen? Even the people who took your parking place this morning. Maybe David's even thinking self-preservation here. If I marry his daughter, maybe he'll stop throwing spears at me. Verse 23. Seeing that I am a poor man and lightly esteemed. And there it is. There subtly, psychologically comes out David's intention. Money and position. taking notes, materialism will get more of our children than drugs and alcohol. Listen to me, parents. Materialism will get more of our children than drugs and alcohol. Very few of the kids in here will end up drug addicts. Very few, I I, I pray it's nobody, very few of our children today will become alcoholics. Amen? One of the best ways to keep that from happening out of your home. Keep it out of your family. Make them know dad doesn't accept it, dad doesn't think it's good. But it is not drugs and alcohol that we have to worry about. It is the shallowness of materialism. It is chasing a dollar and climbing a ladder. It is possessions and things that will keep more people from serving God than anything else. And that is hard to servants of Saul told him, saying, On this manner spake David. And Saul said, Thus shall you say to David, The king desireth not a dowry, meaning, Don't pay for my daughter's hand in marriage, but a hundred foreskins of the Philistines to be avenged of the king's enemy. But Saul sought to make David fall in the hands of the Philistines. Now watch David fall in all three of these attacks. Verse 26. When his servants told David these words, it pleased David well, there's his pride, to be the king's son-in-law the days were not expired. Wherefore David arose and went, and he and his men and slew of the Philistines, not a hundred, but two hundred men. There's his old enemy, the Philistines, again. And David brought their foreskins and gave them in full tale of the king, that he might be the king's son-in-law. And Saul set up, set up, set, gave him Michael, his daughter, to wife. And there's his old weakness again, women. David got unfocused. 